Ani Bosho Sego Tanse Good evening. I'm Duke Redford. In my Anishinaabe language, my name is Mugwam Nisqualbaneje. I'm a Chippewa man of the Turtle Clan, member of the Sagi First Nation. I want to welcome everyone this evening. In keeping with the First Nation Métis and Inuit people's traditions, I wish to acknowledge that this event is located on the ancestral territory of all the Indigenous peoples who have made this place their home from time immemorial. Among these nations are the Three Fires Confederacy, the Chippewa, Potawatomi, and Odawa nations, as well as the Wendat, Huron, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We now all share a covenant with the Indigenous peoples to continue the tradition of compassionate stewardship of these lands so that future generations will be able to enjoy the unblemished beauty of this earth. Remembering always that we never own the land, but rather borrow its use from our children, our grandchildren, and future generations, which we raise with the seven ancestral principles of correct conduct, which is courage, respect, honesty, truth, humility, wisdom, and love. As an Anishinaabe wisdom keeper and elder, I would like to offer the Wenjack and Downey families this indigenous prayer that I hope will convey some comfort at this time of grief and farewell. I give you this one thought to keep. I am with you still, I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow, I am the diamond that glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the early morning hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in the circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not think of me as gone. I am with you still in each new dawn. Megwetch. Also in accordance with our teachings, we acknowledge and honor all the many diverse cultures and people who over time have adopted and made this land their home. In closing, let me share this poem I wrote called Stolen Children, Stolen Souls. It will help to set the context of the evening that follows. It's a memorial to all the children who didn't survive the residential school experience and are forever denied the opportunity to tell their story. However, we the survivors can speak their truth and walk the secret path toward reconciliation. Often when I walk alone among the forests near my home, I hear a faint whisper in the trees, possessed with an insistent urgency. We are, the voices say, the silent victims of a stifled crime. Our bodies lie in unmarked graves. We are the victims of a madness, the casualties of rage. We are, the voices say, the slaughtered innocents of residential schools, the 
their wickedness was our apocalypse. The four horsemen of our demise who came like a whirlwind of destruction, tail riders with evil in their eyes. We are, the voices say, the disappeared, the missing witness, who saw the face of their real intent behind their arrogant benevolence. We lived in terror and we died in fear of neglect, abuse, and suicide. And now we lie in fields beside the institutions where we died. Our souls and spirits and bodies left unclaimed, no cross or marker bears our name. The governments conspired and the churches devised a perfect solution, a flawless disguise. Educate the stolen children, even to their death. Kill the Indian in the child without regret. Heathens need no place to rest. As buffalo bones were left to bleach beneath the prairie sky, so too, the souls of children, stolen from their homes, were left to perish without an honor song, without an honor dance, to say goodbye. This was the first real genocide. And now, the institutions of church and state, whose promise was to educate, apologize for their mistakes and distance themselves from that embrace that produced such venom and disgrace. These children, innocent victims, like lambs led to the slaughter, the schools and governments slew our sons and daughters. I seek a monument to these slain ones, a cenotaph where I might lay a wreath, some place to kneel in wisdom and in grief, to honor the memory of those that died we, the generation that survived, we need to witness to those yet unborn that their spirits were never broken, that in your silent courage, suffering, and pain, we learn to set aside the shame, to live our lives in triumph and in pride. And now, with chant and drum, we promise and solemnly proclaim when we assemble at powwows, work or play, we dedicate a moment as we pray to smudge with cedar, sweetgrass, smoke and sage to the memory of those dear lost children who lie in unmarked graves. Miigwech. In honor of our culture and tradition, I welcome a Shanyang singers who will be singing a traveling song for all those who have gone before us. Chimigwech. <laughs>
Mike Downey is a celebrated storyteller, a writer, director, and producer of numerous documentaries, as well as the founder of Edgar Land Films. He is the winner of a Canadian Screen Award for Best Science Documentary for his film, Invasion of the Brain Snatchers. Please welcome Mike Downey to the stage as he introduces The Secret Path. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I, I just... Uh, there's just a couple things I'd like to say um, before you get a chance to watch. Uh, Gord's performance from last year at Roy Thompson Hall, um, which is extraordinary and important. Um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, across this country for their outpouring um, of grief and um, and sadness. And I can tell you, my family um, has been supported by that. It's made it harder and easier to accept Gord's passing. Harder, because you realize that Gord has um, touched so many people and uh, is now being missed by so many people. And easier, because we, we see how many people uh, across this country truly cared about my brother and that's an extraordinary thing and it's something I'll take with me for the rest of my life. <clears throat> my wish is that this incredible tidal wave of emotion be captured. That it not just flow across the country, that we divert part of that emotion and energy towards something that Gordy really believed in. And that is to improve the lives of indigenous people. And I think, you know, I think opportunity is a funny thing. When Gord and I started to try to tell Chani's story uh, really five years ago, um, Gord wrote these poems. We, were, we wanted to get a writer to write a, a story that we could perhaps adapt into a, into a film. And we were pursuing that and, and, and it wasn't going very far, very fast. And Gord started uh, writing these poems because we had this research package from Ian, At starting with Ian Adams' incredible article from McLean's in 1967 about what happened to this little boy named Charlie Wenjack. Um, Gord started going through this research package that we had on his death and the inquiry um, that was launched after Ian's article. And uh, he started writing these poems. And, and I can tell you, uh, to, my, uh, to my great shame, uh, when he called me the first time and said, I have some news, I, I asked immediately, if we'd heard back from one of the writers that we'd approached about, about taking this project on. And, uh, and he told me, no, but I've written a poem. Duke, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> you won't appreciate my response. But actually, my response was, uh, as an older brother, uh, I, uh, I said, uh, that's great, Gord, that's great. Inside, I thought, what, what, what are we going to do with a poem? We're, we're trying to bring a story into the mainstream. Um, so clearly, I looked right through that opportunity. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. And thankfully, I was smart enough 
uh, not to try to dissuade Gord, because he kept going and he wrote nine more. And, and I think a lot of you know that those 10 poems became 10 songs, and then they helped inspire Jeff Lemire to uh, create the incredible graphic novel, and then we put it all back together again for the animated film. Um, but, you know, I think opportunity is a funny thing. I, I think we often assume that it's, you know, uh, on a pedestal with, um, oh, I don't know, like a nice sort of white or black sort of drape thing, and it's well lit, and there's the opportunity, and you just have to take it. And I think true opportunity is actually very easy to overlook, and it's easy to look right through it. And that's a, that makes it, you know, I think that's what makes opportunity so awesome in its potential. The opportunity we have right now in front of us is an opportunity, I believe, to really change the way Canadians think about their own country. I think that opportunity has been working its way towards the surface for some time, and, and I really feel like it's, it's really on the surface now, that there's this incredible opportunity for our country. The Downey Wenjack Fund, uh, Gordon and I put in place really to do one thing, and that was to capture uh, some of the outpouring uh, that was uh, started last year when uh, Gord made that call from the stage in Kingston, and then followed, we followed it up with the, with the release of Secret Path, and, and we knew that there was going to be quite a reaction. People were curious as to what Gord's next project was, and they wanted to know more, and we wanted to capture as much of that as possible, and we wanted to, you know, as a, as a filmmaker, you understand the cycle that these things go through, and, they, and it can be very, it can get very high, you can get a lot of attention uh, uh, but it has, to, it, it has to move on and the next story needs to come along. And we created the fund to try to capture some of that emotion from a year ago and put that to work. And so we started this fund. We really wanted to um, inspire Canadians to, you know, if, if there was a, you know, if that, uh, the secret path played a part in awareness, that's great. Uh, it is playing a part in education, along with some other great resources that our incredible teachers are using. The next piece is action. And the Downey Wenjack Fund is really there to um, tell Canadians it's okay to act. We want to support you. Um, we want you to whatever it is you do, figure out how you could do that that would improve Indigenous lives. And I, I you're uh, already, we're, um, we've been giving out some grants. It's not much. It's not really about the money for, you know, the design of this. It's about the hearts. It's about people doing something, giving of their time, giving of themselves, and creating relationships. When Gord and Pat and I went up to Ogoki Post, and met the Wenjacks for the first time to show them what we'd done, to ask for their blessing. And I'd been talking to Pearl over the years, and she knew what, what we'd been doing. This is our opportunity to show them. That face-to-face -face meeting changed all three of us. It, we, there was a relationship that was created in that moment of two families that were going that had been going through some tough times. The Wenjacks had been going through, as Gordy said, you know, when they talked about Chani, you'd guess he died 15 minutes ago and not 50 years ago. And they had other tragedies that they were carrying with them. And we, like a lot of families in Canada, we had our own version of that. But being together and creating a relationship changed everything. And it made us feel so much, you know, the weight that we, we were feeling it, made it feel lighter. And we, we really want to perpetuate that kind of opportunity for non-Indigenous Canadians to uh, create these kind of relationships. And we think we can do it with, with, um, by inspiring people to act. We don't need to send rockets off into space. We have a bit of a criteria where we uh, ask people to 
you know, uh, make sure they have an indigenous partner and that, the, you know, this is, it's gonna help in some, in some way, whatever it is that, that they wanna do. It's really about action. It's really about action. And we think that if we plant enough of these seeds across the country, and if we show each other what can be done, we can continue to do that. The big work lies ahead. There's no doubt. There's a crisis going on, as we all know, in communities uh, across, within families and communities across this country. And it's gonna require the resources of every level of government that we have. Where we think we could help a little bit is to keep inspiring Canadians. And, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I, I visualize it standing behind my brother Gord as a Canadian who decided he cared and he'd seen and heard enough and he wanted to do something. And, that, and that's all we really want to do. We just want to inspire individuals to move forward. Um, with the fund, we are supporting educators. Um, as you saw in the, in the short film, there's 40,000 teachers that we know of that are using Secret Path in the classroom. We're supporting them and we're creating a network for them to communicate with each other and share lesson plans. We will continue to do that and then we will add other pieces that are working in the classroom to tell the story of residential schools and to tell the story of, uh, of our indigenous. We also are supporting the Truth and Reconciliation Center. Uh, there is a trust within there that we are, uh, that all the, all the uh, royalties from the Secret Path, Jeff Lemire, Gore Downey, uh, went into the trust, and that, that trust is going to try to find more of these missing children that are in unmarked graves, as Duke referred to. So we wanna, we wanna help support the center and never forget the survivors. And the third piece I just told you about, we want, we want Canadians to, uh, to roll up their sleeves and, and do something. And I think if we do that, that opportunity is going to start to show itself on the beautiful little plinth and the nice lighting. Because that opportunity, I believe, is to change the very idea of who we think we are as a country. I'm going to let you in on something. My brother, Gord, he didn't love the flag waving. And for those of you that have been at a hip show, there was a lot of flag waving at those hip shows. And you know what? It was a lot of fun. He wasn't that comfortable with, with, with all that. And we often talked about our national identity and how it just kind of gets crunched down into this hockey sticks and coffee cups. <laughs> and not a lot more. Yeah, and you, you kind of saw that, I think, in some of the rollout of some of the marketing around Canada's 150th, you know? There weren't, there weren't too many things that kind of, I mean, there's things that made you feel that kind of pride, but I believe, my brother believed, that the missing piece is the fact that we're not a young country. We're not 150 years old. We're over 10,000 years old, 12,000, we are. And, but we can't be that country unless we have a ribbon of indigeneity going right down the middle. That's who we can be. We can be a country that shook off you know, its colonial past, that pulled out of the shadow of a great superpower to the south and just became who we are. We're, I believe we're a compassionate people, but you know, there is some evidence to the contrary. So we have some work to do. And if we can get enough Canadians to start to think about, you know, we missed that opportunity. Our founding fathers missed that opportunity 150 years ago. They stepped right over it. They looked right through it. We got a chance for a reset right now. And we, the more that we can um, appreciate, you know, um, people like Duke Redberg and their teaching and, their, and our understanding of ceremony or, or to begin to understand the teachings and ceremony, the more we are all going to gain by it. You know, 
you learn something in 12,000 years. It only makes sense. So I'd like to, um, I'd just like to wrap up by saying um, my brother and I really, I mean, we crisscrossed this country on our own way, me making films, him, you know, in the back of a tour bus. And we met a lot, we've met a lot of Canadians uh, along the way. And we met a lot of really good people over the years. I think there's a chance in this country right now to show the world who we really are. We can do it, but we need to get started. Thank you very much. Jeremy is the lead vocalist for The Strictly Hip. He is an artist with a big voice and a bigger heart. Jeremy's band, The Strictly Hip, takes on almost academic and studious approach to perform the music of Canada's most popular band. Please welcome Jeremy Hoyle to the stage as he performs an acoustic version, version of Gord Downey's song, The Stranger, from the album Secret Path. I am a stranger You can see me I am a stranger Know what I mean I navigate the mud I walk above the path Jump into my ride Jump to the left On a secret path The one nobody knows And I'm moving fast On a path nobody knows And what I'm feeling is anyone's guess. What is in my head? And what's in my chest? I'm not gonna stop. I'm just catching my breath. They're not gonna stop Please just let me catch my breath On a secret path One that nobody knows And I'm moving fast Nobody knows That is not my dad My dad is not a woman Doesn't even drink My dad is not a woman On a secret path oh, Nobody knows On a secret path oh, Nobody knows I am the stranger I am the stranger In keeping with ceremony, 
We've handed out traditional tobacco ties as you came in. There's also boxes of Kleenex that were passed around. At the end of the evening, our volunteers will have a basket for you on, upon your exit. Any tobacco ties that you would like to offer, any of your tears and prayers and those Kleenex, we're going to take those into a sacred fire and burn those after the event. In keeping with ceremony, I also want to acknowledge, could all of my Indigenous brothers and sisters please stand? We are magnificent as a nation. And as Indigenous people, we have done nothing wrong. We have nothing to reconcile. And reconciliation is on your responsibility as Canadians, and I say chimigwech. Our intermission will only be 15 minutes. Please come back at 8.30. Our uh, auction items will only be open for the next 15 minutes. And we ask that you please return to your seats for 8.30, and I say chimigwech from my heart. Thank you. So as the Executive Director of Bindigan Healing and Arts, Bindigan Healing and Arts is one of the newest nonprofits in York Region, servicing First Nations, Métis and Inuit families in this region. Right now, currently, we have over 14,000 in York Region off-reserve, self-identified First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. We at Bindigan Healing and Arts are doing everything we can to provide culturally appropriate and culturally sensitive programming and access to ceremony for all of our First Nations people. The weight of your heart. In the fall of 2016, four friends, all fervent fans of Gord Downey and the Tragically Hip, were so moved by Gord's project, The Secret Path, and the story of Cheney Wenjack that they launched an ambitious reconciliation and fundraising project called The Walk for Wenjack. Please welcome Terry Manko, Stacy Dion Barker, and Rob Ferreira to the stage as they give us some background information on The Walk and introduce the documentary, The Weight of Your Heart. It was uh, May 24th, 2016. I was on my way to Nashville for yet another tech conference. But this one I was actually really excited for because I was uh, anxious to see the Johnny Cash display at the Country Music Hall of Fame. I was just about to board the plane and a stream of notifications hit my phone. Gordowney had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. My heart dropped. I was shocked, gutted. So many mixed emotions, unlike how many of you felt when you learned the news. It was the longest trip ever, because I had not had a chance to read the details online yet. All that kept circling in my head over and over and over again were the lyrics that went something like this. He said, F this and F that. It can't be Nashville every night. I'll die before I quit. Only a true Tragically Hip fan would know that song, and there may be some of them here tonight. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Ferreira and we're going to share a little, uh, little bit about a journey we um, embarked on. And I'm also joined by my wife Sarah and my daughter Ella uh, who are in the audience tonight. And I want to thank them for their love and support. <laughs> when I got back from Nashville I, needed, I, I knew I needed, needed to somehow give back to a band that gave me so many memories for the last 30 years. Some of you know, uh, may know an organization called Courage for Gord Foundation, and I was honored to help drive it along with a good friend of mine, Rod Nolan, who's also in the audience. And with the support with such a loyal and passionate community, we rally behind the iconic Man Machine Poem Tour, the Secret Path concerts, hosting a number of fundraisers. Uh, we created a website and sold treasured keepsakes, as some of you know all in support of Gord's funds while raising over $170,000 for them. But more importantly, there was a call to action. We knew we needed to do more. Gord said, do something. And the first thing we did is learn more about a dark part of Canada's history and the impact the residential school had on so many of our Indigenous friends. 
It was this time last year when I got a call from Jason Lefebvre. He said, you want to go for a walk? And I chuckled, of course, and piqued my curiosity. He said, let's go for a walk up north and retrace Chani's steps. And more importantly, let's finish the walk he set out to do. Of course, I followed up with, like, are you crazy? Like, do you realize how far this was? And he said, yes, I am, and it's 600 kilometers. At that time, Walk for Wenjack was born, indigenous and non-indigenous walking hand in hand. On our logo, you'll see truth and you'll see hope. A truth and acknowledgement of our past and hope for true reconciliation. We then assembled a walking team and we knew we couldn't have done this alone. We needed the support of some like-minded friends. Unfortunately, Jason couldn't be here tonight. Another person who supported us was our good friend, Veronica Gangno, who helped with many logistics behind the scenes from Winnipeg, so we thank Veronica as well. We then had to get to work. Uh, there was a lot of planning involved, and we had three weeks to do it. Our walk was set to start on November 19th. We prepared a short proposal with the details and presented that to Mike Downey. Uh, we worked on a budget and solicited uh, pr uh, sponsorships. Uh, we worked on an itinerary and plotted our route, which required approval from Chief Alvin Fiddler and Chief Francis Cavanaugh uh, to walk in their respective treaties. And finally, we needed, we needed some awareness, so we distributed a press release with the support of a communications company called Media Style. Many will know the great work that Alan Cross does on air and online. You know, he had supported many Courage for Gord fundraiser, fundraiser initiatives, and more, more recently, the Secret Path Project, which prompted a great blog post about the walk for Wenjack that you see here. We also knew we needed to document the walk. We needed to capture the many treasured moments we knew we would experience, but we struggled to find the perfect person to capture it. One individual, however, reached out to Alan. His name was Joe Clements. And he asked Alan if he can get in touch with the people at Courage for Gord. And just like that, Alan forwarded Joel's email to me. And not only did we find the perfect person to document the walk, but also friendship we will cherish for life. This map here gives you a sense of the distance we traveled and most importantly, the distance that Chani needed to walk to get home. Um, uh, Stacy and Jason and I lived uh, in the Toronto area and uh, Terry in, in um, Ottawa and we each boarded planes and we met in Winnipeg. We then uh, rented a truck and drove uh, three hours in some pretty uh, horrible weather conditions to Kenora. Uh, which became our home base for the next few days. Kenora was also the location of the Cecilia Jeffrey Indi Indian Residential School where we started our walk. And then if you look here, this is where Chani needed to, uh, needed to get to. Stacy's now going to uh, share some uh, memorable moments about the time that we spent with, uh, with Pearl and Daisy. So this slide captures a defining moment of our drive from the airport in Winnipeg to Kenora. We received a last minute call from Mike asking us to pick up Pearl and Daisy on the way to the hotel. They had just finished having dinner after Wee Day. When we, when we arrived, we introduced ourselves, collected their luggage and settled in for the long ride. At first there was awkward silence. We made small talk, but the real icebreaker was when they realized who we were they thought we were hired to drive them around. <laughs> we learned many things from Pearl and Daisy. We dubbed them, them the pearls of wisdom. Things like exercise outside where everything is alive, not inside where everything is dead. Listen to your dreams. They are your connection to the creator. Slow down and chew your food. Your stomach doesn't have teeth. <laughs> And my favorite, listen even when no one is talking and stop flapping your lips. Pearl said that to us over dinner. <laughs> we learned many things from Pearl and Daisy. What I will never forget is how they made us feel. 
They made us feel like family and they called us Team Wenjack. We also experienced many spiritual coincidences. Outside the hotel on day one, there was an eagle circling above. At the site of Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School, before anyone arrived, there was a deer by the monument. During the walk, ravens had followed us. At our first rest stop, we saw a figure of a boy in the fire, which later showed up in a picture that we took. At the Knorr Reddit Highway sign, Joel found six red hawk feathers. And when we arrived at the railway tracks, there was another eagle circling above. So here's a bird's eye view of our walk. Uh, more importantly, the route that uh, Chani took. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we started in Kenora at the location where the uh, residential school once stood. Uh, and with the help of so many local volunteers, uh, we had rest stops every five kilometers. We provided water and, and snacks just to allow us to refuel a little bit. There were uh, many local volunteers. Um, sorry, uh, there was lots of winding roads and, and beautiful scenery. Um, lots of opportunity to listen and learn um, about so many stories that were shared uh, with us by residential school survivors. And approximately six hours and 50,000 steps, we reached uh, Reddit. Uh, this is where Chani's uh, journey continued along the railway towards uh, Far Lane. You can see that uh, just up here. Um, however, this is... Um, where our journey officially ended. Uh, unfortunately, it was just too unsafe to continue along a very narrow a stretch of whale railway. However, we uh, all took comfort knowing that some Wenjek family members who joined us um, had received some closure uh, getting to this point, and therefore we marked the area with this beautiful wooden uh, monument uh, created by my good friend, uh, Leanne Mackle. Um, it was inspired, of course, by Chani's picture that we've all grown, uh, grown to love. And this marks the approximate area of where Chani's uh, final resting spot was. It was approximately uh, 15 uh, kilometers east of uh, Reddit. Along our journey, there were, there were many, um, many special moments. Um, here are just uh, three. Um, along our walk to Reddit, there, are, uh, there were many times this particular raven would uh, circle us, and it, it really felt like uh, she was guiding us on, uh, on Chani's path. Um, we also experienced um, moments where we saw Chani's image appearing in a fire that Stacy alluded to earlier. Um, and, and if you look closely enough in this particular fire, you also may, uh, may see him too. At the end of our walk, um, we hung an orange bandana from a tree. Um, we placed our, our Chani Wenjack and Courage for Gord rubber bracelets uh, that some of you I know in the audience are also wearing. Um, and we placed them on these branches here. And just as I placed mine, um, I saw this brilliant ray of sunshine. Um, it was shining right down on them. And it was that particular moment where we knew that Chani was also with us in spirit. This particular shot here is uh, a shot of many of the folks that join us on the walk. Um, um, you'll see a number of Wenjek family members, um, as well as uh, residential school survivors and uh, local community uh, that, were, that were able to join us on the walk. So we're very grateful for all the folks that uh, participated. Oh. Thank you to our sponsors who supplied us with travel, lodging, food, and clothing. And thank you, Mike, for your help with arranging this. We also are thankful for the many gifts we received, um, for the gifts we received from Elder Grandma Shingus and Red Cedar, who gave us sacred medicine and medicine bags for our journey. None of this would have been possible without the support of Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler from Treaty 9, who connected us to Grand Chief Francis Cavanaugh 
and Larry Henry from Grand Council Treaty 3. Grand Council Treaty 3 guided our walk, set up rest stops, fed us, and gave us gifts, but most of all, they made us feel welcome. Next slide. Um, this next slide is a very special gift we each received from Karen Ruiz of Lily Putt Hats. Karen created these after Gord's now iconic sock scarves that he wore during the Man Machine poem tour. Created with love, Karen added a match to each one as a reminder of Chani's journey when he was given just seven matches to keep warm. Karen's kindness and generosity continues as she had created and donated a very special hat for tonight's auction. And we are proud to call her our friend. Thank you, Karen. I know you're there somewhere. <laughs> I am grateful to introduce to you this evening our friend Joel Clements. Joel's interest in photography began at a young age when he purchased his first vintage camera at a yard sale. After receiving his Bachelor of Fine Arts with honours from York University and pursuing many opportunities in his field, Joel went on to establish his own business in graphic design and photography and continues to teach his passions at part-time at Durham College. While researching our friend for tonight's event, I consulted his website where you will find an array of beautiful photographs and this quote, which speaks to tonight's presentation. Photographs have the ability to communicate a story in a precise and moving way that transcends the barriers of written and spoken language. I am humbled and honored to introduce the weight of your heart a Walk with Chani Wenjack. This is the debut of the powerful documentary produced by Joel. In November of 2016, Joel joined us in Kenora, Ontario to document the walk for Wenjack, during which a group of walkers representing both the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community retraced the final steps of Chani Wenjack in support of the Downey Wenjack Fund. Joel describes the work as a conversation and vision shared between himself and the spirit of Chani as he tries to process his experience walking in his footsteps along the secret path. He has captured an immersive experience through a collection of photographs, video, and audio. His hope is to ignite a spark, even if only in one or two of you here tonight that will motivate you to take the journey and find your role in reconciliation. Joel's journey began with the simple goal of making friends with the Indigenous community and a willing, willingness to listen, learn, and change. We thank you all for being here tonight, as being here is a step in the right direction. As you watch this documentary, and as you leave here tonight, continue to ask yourself, how can I further incorporate reconciliation in my life? What will you do? Thank you. On October 16, 1966, a 12-year-old Anishinaabe boy named Chani Wenjack ran away from Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School in Kenora, Ontario in an attempt to reunite with his family in Agoki Post, a tiny, isolated community over 600 kilometers away. It was a journey that Chani had no hope of completing. His body was found a week later, 20 kilometers east of the town of Reddit, Ontario, beside the railway tracks. Chani had frozen to death. On November 19, 2016, a group of walkers set out from the former site of Cecilia Jeffrey School and retraced the final journey of Chani. They did so with the blessing and support of the Wenjack family and Grand Council Treaty No. 3. The group included residential school survivors, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, young and old from across Ontario and Manitoba, 
all joining together in the spirit of reconciliation to bring honor and attention to the story of Chani Wen Jack and the historical mistreatment of Canada's indigenous people. On the day before the walk, I rise early to visit with you alone. It'll be easier this way. I know that when you speak to my heart, there will be tears. What else could there be? I'm at your school before the rising of the sun, and it's cold. You remember the cold, don't you? From the north, and damp. They're still there. Rusted and missing seats, tucked away, surrounded by long grass, rusted pipe and chains. They swayed in the wind when I saw them for the first time, as if a child had just hopped off to join in a game of tag. Can you believe they're still there? The very swing sets, the ones you played on 50 years ago, they're still there but broken, silent and cold. And there's a rock in the middle of the cedars. In honor of all the children, it says. Today, it is in honor of you. They are young and old. They are red and white. Among them are survivors. That's what they call themselves, survivors. The vast whiteness of Canada attended school while they struggled just to survive it. Over 150,000 Inuit, Métis, and First Nation children were sent to these residential schools. Thousands died. This is Canada's inconvenient truth. This is the dark history that tarnishes our prideful collection of silver trophies. These people walk so that this history will be known and won't be forgotten. These people walk so that survivors can heal. These people walk the bridge that spans the gap between two cultures, and they do so arm in arm. This is reconciliation. Not a first step, but 50,000 steps towards friendship and trust. The trust that we have broken for hundreds of years.
I stand beside the road as the walkers pass, listening to the gentle hum of conversation, of breathing, and the crunch of gravel underfoot. Tom sings a song of healing and points to the sky as his song floats up to where the eagle is drawing lazy circles above us. The messenger. Does he bring the song to you as we follow in your footsteps? We follow you 50 years behind. If only we could catch up, wrap our arms around you, and tell you not to go. There is beauty here along the edge of the path. The asphalt ribbon slithers its way among a thousand lakes and giant monuments of granite. As we walk where you walked, we are visited by deer and eagle and raven. As we see what you have seen, our eyes catch a glimpse of the creator. In the beauty of the frozen lake, in the wind and snow, and in the heart that beats within our chest. As we walk, we see you here, here, and here. We see you in the flames of the warming fire. One of us sees you run across the road and disappear into the bush so quickly she's not sure what she saw. I see you in the raven. I see you in the raven because you have been transformed from a boy into an idea. You clarify my vision. You have unwrapped secrets that I have never known. You have unwrapped secrets of the lost and the disappeared. 
You reach out to me from that far off place and you bring knowledge and healing. You bring healing to all the survivors and also to us, the witnesses. You have brought us together to walk the secret path. As we walk, we see you in the snow that gently falls on cedar. You are with us here, here, and here. It's 30 kilometers to Reddit from Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School. More than eight hours walking. 50,000 steps. They say you made it here by nightfall on the day you ran away. The railway tracks run through Reddit. The secret path. And now I'm here. Me. I see the rocks along the tracks red and brown and sharp and i see the rusted rails capped by bright silver ribbons i touch the cold rail and you touch me It is a thought that's been on my mind since arriving here in Kenora. What was the weight of your heart? Not the clinical, quantifiable weight of it. I know the answer to that question. The coroner waited on the day you were found. It was 130 grams. No, not the physical weight. What I've wrestled with is the immeasurable. That center of us that cradles love and longing alongside sorrow and hate. What was the weight of that part of you? That last time you stumbled and lay down next to the tracks. What was the weight of your heart? Was it still lightened by the thought of going home? Or was your heart heavy with the realization that there was no secret path? And so I wonder. In those moments that you walk towards this spirit world, what was the weight of your heart? On my last morning in Kenora, I stand where the children sleep. It is silent and still as morning breaks. The children's beds are marked by weathered white crosses or depressions in the overgrown grass, frosted and sparkling in the sun. Some are unnamed and unknown, but all are loved. All are missed. Somewhere, perhaps among black spruce or tamarack, their cuckum sits and waits for them. When will you come, she asks. When will you come home? Home. <laughs> 
sagi espenge ki otote e we pemachi beautiful big chimigwech to Joel Clements for that documentary and for all of my brothers and sisters in Treaty 3 and for all of our lost children. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. I've had the honor of knowing this woman, my elder, my teacher. Um, my daughter, since she was little, has known Shirley through Trent University Indigenous Studies Program. She is Professor Emeritus, sorry, I don't know how to say that, Trent University. Dr. Williams is a member of the Bird Clan of the Ojibwe and Odawa First Nations of Canada. Her Anishinaabe name is Migaze Okwe, meaning Eagle Woman. She was born and raised at Wigwemakong, Manitoulin Island, and attended the St. Joseph's Residential School in Spanish Ontario. Please welcome Elder Dr. Williams to the stage as she tells her story. Can't see anybody. <laughs> Which is a good thing you probably can see me though. <laughs> anyway, I thought I was on a panel. Am I the only one that's on a panel? <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to speak, but anyway, um, I'm Shirley Williams and uh, I'm a survivor of the uh, residential school, which was in St. Joseph's residential school in Spanish. 
Spanish Ontario. I um, did not go to school until I was 10 years old. Uh, they did come and get me when I was seven years old. Somehow my father knew that he wanted to keep one of his children at home. So when he told the, um, the priest and the Indian agent that came, was he wanted to homeschool me and he would teach me the catechism, which is the catchy sentence. They believed him, but he didn't say in what language. So my school began the next day. He, um, we always had breakfast where we made um, uh, plans what, what we're gonna do for the day. But at that time, it was different. So that morning, he talked to my mother. And he said, all the other children that are gone to our children, they're gone to residential school. When they come back, they don't want to speak the language. And they don't want to participate in the culture. That song sort of got me at the end. Um, so where was I? Oh, yes, so he was telling that to my mother. And then he turned around to me and he says, you don't know why I'm telling you this, but someday you will understand. I want one of our daughters to stay home and know the language and culture. All the others except for the oldest, one of my oldest brother, he didn't go to school. They didn't take him because he had disability in his eye. So all the other, all my sisters and brothers, they all went. But they all told their stories when they would come home and they would tell me someday you probably will have to go too. So they, I knew what was going on there, but I only saw them in the summer. Actually, I didn't even know I had brothers and sisters until one day they, was, they were so noisy, there were so many children. And uh, it is when I found out they were part of my family uh, when I was younger. And they all wanted to maul me. So, and, and this is when I knew that they, were, they went to school far away and then they would come home. And um, it started like that. And so for the ne from seven years old on to 10 years old, I did not leave my mother or my father's side they taught me all of the traditional education, such as hunting, fishing, gathering, and trapping. Medicines, kinds of things that we had to pick, <clears throat> what time to pick, and all of these things. They, uh, they, uh, they talked about it, and they only spoke in the language. Um, the last year, when I was turned 10, is when they start to, uh, to tell me a little bit about the English. Like, do you know your prayers? What is your name? And do you pee pee? Those three things were very important. I didn't know that, but I, I did. I found out when I did go to the residential school. So my turn came um, at the age of 10 when I had to go on a team of horses to town where I was to get on the, on the bus. In that time, there was no highways, but by the time I reached that age, there were highways and there was a school bus who used to um, come and pick us up. When I went that morning, I know the night before, I know that my father cleared his throat. I don't think they slept that night. And it was like as if there was death, you know, that, that there was something going on. And I didn't sleep very well either. When I reflect back today. But um, I did find out that when I went that morning, there was four things that he told me before getting on a bus. Is do not forget who you are. Remember your language and culture. No matter what they do to you in there, be strong. And fourthly, go
go and learn about the Inanak and come back and teach us what the Inanak is so restricted to us. Those are the four things that he told me. He says, you don't know why I'm telling you this, but someday you will. All these times, whenever we were picking berries or whenever I wanted to play, he would always say that to me. Pay attention, my daughter, because someday, how will you know? How will you know when somebody gives you tobacco? How will you answer that? So then I would pay attention then and go to work. Um, so that time that I was leaving on the bus, I was very glad to, to go to school. I was excited, but I didn't really, I was afraid because I really didn't know what I was going into. When I uh, got to the residential school, that's the, uh, the entrance, there were three things that I experienced. One is the entrance, second was socialization, the, th uh, the uh, third was the liberation. So my entrance at the residential school is the bus was going in and they opened the gate. And when they opened the gate, and then when the bus went in, and after when the bus went in, they locked the gates again. I still can remember that, that sound when they locked the gate. And I think that's when my heart also locked. From then on, the nun came on the, um, on the bus and said, gave us instructions to tell us how we're going to, how we're going to walk, where we're going to go. I didn't understand English. I only really spoke the native language. But the girl that was sitting beside me, she understood English and she also understood Nishnabe, so she would whisper and tell me what she, she was saying. What we had to do was that when we get up, is, uh, we had to file one by one, and then when you get out, you had to go two by two and pick up your suitcase and, and go up four flights of stairs with your little suitcase that your mother packed. And then when we got on top of the uh, stairs, there was a big long table. The first girl asked, you know, what is your name? I was so proud that I understood that word, what is your name? So I was proud to say my name was Shirley Fesson. And the second girl, she says, oh, let me look. And so she looked in the big book. And she says, oh, right here, she says, she's number 19. And so, and, I, and then she said, whispered very, so that because the nuns was not too far away. She says, whenever they call you, you can't answer Shirley Fesson. You have to answer you, number 19. So I became number 19. And the third girl is she had the bundle ready. Um, the, in the bundle was a long pair of socks, granny socks that the young girls wouldn't wear today. Long bloomers. And they're slowly coming back. <laughs> and chemise. Chemise are tank tank tops that you're wearing today. Well, we wore those under. And then from there, the nun asked, do you pee pee? I understood that again, and I thought. And so she said, tut, 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 she says, oh, she was really mad, and I was wondering why she was so angry. Anyway, I got to the uh, dormitory. In one section was, there was beds in there. I don't know how many beds, but there, you know, there was a section there. But the section was all full of lumps. The bed wasn't very nice. When I looked in the other, there was all kinds of good beds on that side, and they were nicely made. But the bed that I got was very lumpy. And I wondered, why did I get such an ugly looking bed? There, the bed was made out of straw. That's where they put the bed wetters. So the next day, I got up when there was an inspection at the polio sheet, and there was a wet spot. The girls were scolded, and then were, had to wash their own sheets that they wet. But mine wasn't, there was no wet spot. So she came to me and asked me again, do you pee pee? And of course, I shook my head this way. And again, I wasn't telling lies. And she pulled me about a year. You know, there's an aisle here. That's where she took me. And all the other girls were asked to say something to me. Well, I didn't know what they said because they spoke in English. 
but I didn't like the sounds what they were making. Here they were told to say something that was ugly, like bedwetter, a stupid girl, all of these things, what they were told to say. So it was my first experience was humiliation as a young girl. For, and then for me, I was not telling lies because there's not one in this room that doesn't pee pee. So that I remembered and that was the start. Even before I went to bed, um, after getting that bed, is they took us to the, um, um, where the washrooms were and a bathtub and this is where they cut your hair and give you a bath. I tried to tell her that uh, I had a bath, that my mother gave me a bath, but she didn't believe me. And so all of these things that uh, they, uh, they taught us then began that, that very day. We were told never to speak in our language because we would be strapped. We were, not, we were told never to talk about your culture because your culture was witchcraft. You're a pagan. And so uh, this is what we were told. And because we, got, we became afraid to talk about these things, we began to be afraid to, to speak for fear of, of being punished. So we didn't want to be punished and didn't want to get the strap. So we got a strap if you're caught. And if you're caught, depending on how many times, well, you got a small one. If you're caught more than that, you got the middle kind. And then, you know, the, uh, the long kind was, was a big one for bigger sins, such as running away or um, stealing or fighting or whatever. Um, this is when you got that horse whip, you know, the ones, the cowboys and the Indians on, on TV that you see, they whip their horses this way and it's long. Well, that's what, that's what we got. All of those things, um, you know, everything was, um, you saw, some you saw or something, um, you know, being trained and being in an institution, you were never taught to, you know, to be uh, kind or to be loved. We never celebrated our birthday. Um, yeah, it was made fun of us and all of these things. So when you make fun of somebody, it doesn't, it's not very nice. You don't feel very good about it. So. I can understand Charlie not wanting to be in an institution where he was not accepted and he was being treated not so kindly. They uh, taught us, you know, they decolonized our minds so that we could reach and go to heaven. You know, I didn't even realize that um, uh, when they were teaching us about catechism, they always told us that we were pagans and that we were born with a sin <clears throat> and that we didn't have a soul until we were baptized. Well, I didn't even know I had a soul until in 1962 when the Canadian government and the Pope announced that we, we did, in fact, have souls. I went home to my father to ask, you know, what they were teaching me. And I asked my father, you know, do we have a word for soul? Do we have souls as Nishnabek? And then he says, he thought about it. And then he turned around and said, yes, we do have a soul. We have a word for it. He said, why? And so I told him what they told me. He says, no. He says, if we didn't have a word in our own language, then we wouldn't have a soul. But we do have a word in our language. Therefore, we do have souls. Don't believe them what they tell you. Just, just go in there and live to the best way that you know how, because it's only for a time. So all these, these things that we were trained for so many years while in the institution was they were decolonizing our mind to not to live our culture, to, to be as a white person, not as a native person. Because whenever they taught us that, um, I began to wonder if I was Nishinaabekwe or a white woman. And then I became to wonder, who was I? Who was Shirley? 
I didn't find out until I came to Trent University, um, you know, to really who Harry was. I quit school when I was 16. Not that I'm encouraging anybody if they're 16 years to quit school. I love school. I love the education. But I could not tolerate the, um, how we were treated. It was not very nice. And so I quit school and I promised that I would find work and that I would go back to school sometime. When I told my father and asked permission to quit school, is I took a feather out. He took a feather out. And he says, this is here is the first part. He says, we train you in Anishinaabe education. And this side is the school that you're going to, which is the beginning of your academics. Perhaps these two, you will need to fill. Maybe this is where you need to fill this. Maybe that's why you're here. So, uh, yes, I did stay home and help my mother. But then, you know, there were other things that were coming in. One day she was sewing away, making teepees, and I was sitting there not doing anything. And she said to me, Shirley, what are you doing? You're just sitting there. You know, there's not enough daylight in a day for a woman to be sitting there today. Look around. What needs to be done? And that sort of made me mad and it sort of made me wonder, why, why was I sitting there? Why wasn't I doing anything? Why, you know, what was, what was I waiting for? So I looked. I looked around and I thought, yeah, I could sweep the, sweep the floor, wash the floor, wash the dishes, carry water, and all of these things they came from pouring, which I did. And you know what? It was evening in no time. So my day was full. I began to appreciate, you know, what she told me, but that night I wondered, you know, why, you know, why didn't I, why didn't I move? It was many years after that I discovered that why I did not move because I was waiting for her to ring the bell. While we were in there, they rang the bell for us to move, to do something. So that's what I was waiting for. But I didn't find it was a flashback of something. You know, I was waiting for her to ring the bell so that I could start to, uh, to do work. There are a lot of things that, uh, that really triggers our feelings. I was at the workshop one time. And this man was sitting beside me, and he had a pin. And the pin he had, he had in his pocket, and he took it out, and he had it in his hand. And he kept on. Didn't make that sound. Anyway, he does what he kept on doing. And that really bothered me. And then I thought, how should I say this, or what should I say to him? And finally, I braved enough, and I touched his arm, and I said, Sir, I says, you know, that's really annoying. <laughs> um, you know, can you put, oh, he says, I thought he was ready. I was ready to, you know, I uh, thought he was going to really give a good talking to, to me or swear or something. Anyway, he didn't. He was very kind, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. And then that night I went home and I thought, why was, you know, why did that bother me so much? Because I've never done that in my life. And so I thought about it and then, you know, at the following day, it struck me that those uh, clippers, the sound was what they used for us to get up, to kneel down, and to stand up. So those sounds, so sometimes, even today, those uh, triggers come back. You never know when they're going to come, come to you, but they do come. Flashback is something, how you were raised in that. Much later on, I came, I went back to school. Uh, little by little, I went through um, correspondent courses I took in order to go get through my self-education. I finished my grade in 9 and 10, and then 11 and 12. My parents passed away after, and so I was free to do, and I thought I would go back to school. 
in this time, I saw a little ad in the paper, and it says indigenous studies or native studies. And so I thought, hey, that's what I want. That's what I've been looking for. So I enro enrolled at Trent University in order to go back to school. But I didn't really know why I was going back to school. But I came to find out that I wanted to find out once and for all about the scene in act. Two is I wanted to find that little girl by the name of Shirley. And this is where I found her at Trent University, learning about our in indigenous ways of life. When I finished at Trent University, everything was uh, forcing me to go into a language. And so I went to learn because I got a job at Trent University teaching language and culture. And then I thought, gee, it's okay to be fluent, but then how do you teach the language? So I went back to school again at Lakehead University to go and learn about orthography, how to read and write in our own language. See, uh, my father knew what he was doing because he didn't let me go to school until the age of 10. So that language was f firmly grounded in my, my brain. So I never lost it. Other kids, when they, were, when they were five years old, six years old, they lost the language. And for fear of... Uh, losing the language, they, um, they, um, they gave it up, we abandoned it. There's um, actually something that happens while you're in there, is when you're, ban um, you choose to either abandon it, do you like it or dislike it? It's the anomaly stage. And I found that out when I was uh, taking psychology. And so that's, uh, where I found out really what the institution did to me. And so when I got the job at Trent University, I was teaching that one day and my mind went, flat, um, went back to the minds of the year when I was in residential school, where the nuns told me that my language was not important, that I would never get a job, that I would never use it. And so that's what I was thinking when I had my first class and I thought, Ooh, maybe they're turning over their graves. <laughs> Here I am teaching the language, the very thing that they said it was pagan, you know. And so I love teaching the language because that language is our identity, is part of our culture. It's what restored me. It's what healed me as a Native woman through the institution, restoring that, that part back. So I believe we have... Um, panel coming up now, so I'll just end in one minute here, because, uh, you know, there's so, m such a long story of things that we went through, but the time that we have here, I'm not able to really tell you everything um, about really, really what happened. So my, my thoughts is, uh, Yes, I did go back to school in order to regain my own identity back, to regain what was stolen from me and what was downgraded be to be humiliated and being not accepted. I had to turn that around and look for Shirley, that little child that was, that was lost, and then take her back. And that's what I learned from the elders and also other psychotherapist when I was finding, finding my healing journey. So I'll end here and the panelists, okay, miigwech. Miigwech, and I apologize, Shirley, in our teachings, we never interrupt our elders and we let them speak and I enjoy and I love hearing you speak. So it's a very cultural thing for me to have to interrupt you and I apologize very much. Um, I would like to introduce our panel, our panelists for tonight and due to time constraints, I'm only going to ask them each one question. Um, we are going to forego the question and answer period because we are gone a little bit over the time. Um, and then we will have a closing with Mayor Dave Barrow and a Shun Young singers, Jacob Charles. So right now I'd like to welcome Dr. Duke Redbird to the stage, Perva Churi, and of course, Dr. Shirley Williams.
So my first question, um, I'm going to start with you, Shirley, because you were already in the hot seat. Um, Dr. Williams, among many titles and honors, you have been described as an elder and an activist. What significance do these two roles have in your life? And also, the question of what will you do, what is the message you want the audience to take home with them tonight? What is, I was asked that last year about aging in activism. You know, for me, being active, being, for playing in activism, um, I really didn't have that kind of word, or we don't have that kind of word. But being active, we just do what we have to do, what is right. So for me, writing the books, restoring the language that was taken away from us, I wanted to give and return that to our, our people the ones that didn't have a chance to learn the language or culture. So that's, uh, that was uh, being active, I guess that's my part. And also, I do a lot of things and I do talks and, um, you know, uh, right now, I think being active in uh, restoring the, uh, the, uh, the culture part, which is the water, the water walks, so we do water walks. What I'd like to leave you is that, um, you know, is to, uh, we saw some of the things here, restoring rights to the Aboriginal people, treaty rights. We're all treaty people. We need to respect those treaty rights so that we can live together. What was meant to when the settlers came here in North America? Reconciliation, to, to reconcile what was happened to, to fix that what was broken and so that we can live together as a human being, to love one another as human beings is what the Creator meant to do. So I'll end that. Miigwech. Miigwech. Purva Churi is with the Downey Wenjack Fund. Purva, can you please tell us a little bit about what your role is with the fund? My official role with the fund is development associate. Over the last week, it's kind of turned into a bit more, but essentially marketing communications merchandise, which is actually for sale in the lobby, and it's uh, been a bit of a hit, and uh, our new website as well, which just re recently launched. Thank you. Dr. Duke Redbird, um, you are a poet, journalist, activist, businessman, and actor. What do you see the biggest challenge facing non-Indigenous as they move towards reconciling our relationship with Indigenous nations in Canada? The, the biggest problem, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the dominant society, you mean? What uh, their biggest challenge is? <clears throat> it's basically to understand that the Indigenous people have a different lens than the Western European lens. Remember that when the settlers came over, um, there were uh, approximately 60 uh, languages spoken in uh, North America. There were approximately 25 million or more indigenous people here. Uh, we had lived uh, uh, from what the archeologists and anthropologists are telling us now, uh, they've pushed back our timeline uh, uh, to 100,000 years, that the first uh, uh, peoples that uh, have been uh, uh, discovered who lived in uh, California, uh, this is just recent uh, uh, information that's been developed, is that the first human beings in the, in the Americas have been, the timeline has been pushed back to 100,000 years. Uh, so the main thing is to, is to remove all those distortions that uh, the uh, schools and the, the education and the universities have been teaching for so long. This story that somehow or other uh, uh, 10,000 years ago, so a group of people came across the Bering Strait and landed in the Americas and that this is our ancestry, this is a distortion, it's not true. It's not real. Actually, uh, there is a lot of evidence that uh, the DNA of, uh, of indigenous peoples is unique in, in the world. And this has just come about recently since uh, 
since they've been doing DNA testing and ancestry uh, uh, testing, they found out that, wow, there's a, a DNA that exists in the Americas that has no evidence that it appears anywhere else on Earth. Uh, so the biggest challenge facing the uh, school system and the educators is uh, to discover the real timeline and the real truth of uh, the world that has been denied the education system for so long. Our timeline of 100,000 years in the Americas does not exist anywhere to be taught uh, and shared with the, with the dominant culture. The dominant culture has been denied one third of the information and education available to them from this side of the world. Most people don't understand that 70% of the food that you eat every morning or every day was uh, uh, cultivated by indigenous people. There was no rubber in the world before uh, uh, the uh, uh, discovery of the Americas. There was no chocolate in the world. There was no corn in the world. There were no t uh, uh, tomatoes in the world. There was no potatoes in the world. There were no chili peppers in the world. It all came from this side of the ocean. But this hasn't been taught to anyone in, uh, in, the, in the school system for so long. Uh, the, our children have been denied all this information. And that's, that's only the beginning. There's, uh, we have uh, an encyclopedia of, of indigenous knowledge that uh, has not been uh, revealed to the education system. So that's a start. <laughs> so as much as I could sit and listen to all of them speak for hours on end, I know that it's getting late into the evening. Some of us have young uh, teen and, and youth with us. Um, I know Purva wants to speak a little bit about Cheney Wenjack Fund. Um, I just want to acknowledge my elders, Duke and Shirley, who I have spent a lot of my formative years learning from both of you and I say Chimi Gwetch for the knowledge that you share and that despite our history you just have that kindness and gentleness when you speak and you honor each of us and honor all the four directions coming together and I just want to say Chimi Gwetch to my elders that are on the stage here. Thank you. So I won't take too much of your time. I know it's been a bit of a long night. Um, and I apologize, Mike did want to stay for the panel, but unfortunately he had to leave. And I just, just want to speak a little bit about the fund in terms of what we're doing, which is kind of the biggest question that we get. Um, I'll direct you to our website for more details, but essentially we have an initiative called Reconcilia Actions. So we've taken the word reconciliation and turned it into Reconcilia Action. So basically we fund small grassroots initiatives that wouldn't have the resources to act. And the first grant that we gave out was for something called Hockey Cares. And we helped bring children from Attawapiskat, Ontario, who had never left reserve to come to Oakville, Ontario and play hockey on integrated teams with other children. And it was amazing. And in November, we're helping send those kids from Oakville to go to Attawapiskat. Um, and then another initiative that we're doing, and we were to roll tape, but we unfortunately don't have time, but the video is on our website as well, and it's an initiative called Legacy Rooms. And we are encouraging corporations, businesses, schools across Canada to join the movement of the Legacy Room program, which essentially is a safe space meant for reconciliation that people can discuss the legacy of Gord, the legacy of Cheney Wenjack, and the legacy of the residential school system. Thank you. I would like to welcome Mayor Dave Barrow, Richmond Hill, to end our evening with us.
This has been uh, uh, quite an evening. I'm here to thank some people on your behalf, and I too will not be long. This was an incredible presentation. We were enlightened that the history of our Indigenous people has been a secret to us until recently, and now we have learned of the stories and of the unbelievable treatment that the Indigenous people suffered. First, I want to thank Joel Clement, an ordinary man as he describes himself, but an ordinary man who was moved by the late Gordon Downey, moved by his plea for Canada to address its historical mistreatment of the Indigenous people. Gord drew attention to the legacy of Canadian residential schools by calling on all of us to take action. Joel was moved to that action and found himself on an eye-opening excursion that he described into the world of hurt in Northern Ontario. And I use that, those words as Kim Zarzer described them in our local newspaper, The Liberal. They're very true, the world of hurt. It showed him we can all make a difference no matter how small that difference may be. I also want to thank Marge Andre, David West, Suzanne Smoke, Georgina for insisting, assisting the Indigenous peoples to bring the story of Chani Wenjek to us. A story that we saw of a young boy who ran away from school just to be with his family. You folks have all struck a nerve in this community. I want to thank those three who joined Joel in awakening us to that history. I'm very proud of Richmond Hill and York Region and the communities that you all have come from because you responded to Gordon and Joel's call to action by your being here this evening. As Mike reminded us, what will you do what we witnessed and heard in the discussion tonight should bring us all to a higher level for the push of reconciliation with truth and hope, as it was described by Courage for Gord group. And we must continue to encourage those that are working on that project to bring it to a reality in a timely manner. It's been a long time. I want to thank all the sponsors. I want to thank all those that have made donations. Uh, those funds will, su will support being again Healing and Arts, local Indigenous programs, as described to us by Suzanne, the Indigenous community, the Wenjek family in particular, who are spending a lot of their own money to tell their story. We can help them with the funding programs that have been set up, GoFundMe, the Downey Wenjek Foundation, we need to make sure that we see that the call of action is not forgotten when we leave this building tonight. Gord has asked us to do something. We be damn well better do it. What are you going to do? Chimidretch, a very big thank you to all here and to you folks for being here to learn more about what we can do. Good night. We would like to end the evening with an honor song sung by Jake Charles from a Shun Young Singers. I'm going to ask each of you to rise for a final time in honor of Cheney Wenjack, in honor of the Wenjack families, Gord Downey and the Downey family, and my wonderful elders Shirley and Duke Redbird. We honor, we honor this song for each and every one of you.
help them communicate with the great spirit and our relatives that are in the spirit world. So as I sing these two songs, I want you to imagine a, a beautiful light that the Creator, the Creator sent this light is surrounding the family of the Downey family with love and comfort. Yeah. 